Infinity players have enjoyed a plethora of relaunches in the past few years. We're talking Shas Vasti, Corregidor, the Military Orders, the Morats. All of these coincide with a host of resculpts, as well as a bunch of new strategic options. This year is the forces of the Steel Phalanx and the Hassassin Baram. Corvus Belly sent me a free copy of Operation Black Wind for review. This video is part unboxing, part backstory, and it's all the honest truth. After all, there's always the emergency buttons if things go sideways with CB, so you can trust me to share genuine opinions and excitement. This being my first unboxing video, I threw up the camera and I jumped right in. Nice looking box. Let's see. Warcrow. For more Warcrow, check out Corner Case. Introductory booklet. Nice looking terrain pack, nice and thick. I really appreciate the sturdiness of this terrain and I can't wait to put it together. Okay, we see got some dice. The box itself is nothing special. Sorry, Universal Head. I don't think that you'll be storing your miniatures in here. I am a big fan of all of the new art. There are some new illustrations and lots of new lore to read. Um, a lot of this will be replicated in other places, but it's still interesting and you get a slightly extended version too. The photos are good. I really like the painting guide quite a bit. Check it out, a nice warm base, perfect to go with the cool colors of the steel phalanx, very nice. I think that I really wanna repaint my old models too because they just don't hold a candle to the vibrant stuff you see. How are these dice? Let's take a look. Uh, I know that they often roll low, or at least that's what I'm told and that's what it feels like. Let's see. Okay, yep, uh, pretty low, good stuff CB, I'll use these for shooting. I like the Code 1 rules a decent amount, and if somebody wanted to play Code 1, I think it's still a pretty good time. It's not quite my thing, I like the full game more, but this is a good guide if you want to learn how to play it. Good overall. I also like the new items and units that they're showing off. In combination with the concept art, it gives you a lot of fun stuff to look forward to. I like that. Introductory booklet is good. Overall, it gets a thumbs up. I did some more reading, and I like that there's illustrations I haven't seen before, especially of the weapons. The alternate color schemes give you some good inspiration, taking a page out of Games Workshop's book. Plus, the how to work with metal models guide seems tailor-made for anybody who's coming from Games Workshop stuff. I love anything that makes the game seem more accessible and less intimidating. Uh, the map is only one-sided. They used to all be posters, but I wasn't hanging them up, so this is just fine. I want to use the map. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, models all look pretty good. Should all be here. And if they're not, they've all got the little complaint code, so getting replacements with Corvus Belly has never been an issue for me. I'm a huge fan of Aleph, I'm a huge fan of Haki's Lam. The lore and writing here is their usual mixture of nonsensical and very interesting. Translating from a romance language must be tough. Corvus Belly's in-house writing style is always a little bizarre, and I like it. It always feels like you're reading a manga or watching an OVA from Japan where the translation is good, but not perfect. Just a little bit nonsensical. As for the contents, I like that it relates to the international campaign that they held a few weeks ago. So you get some cool stuff about Darpan Xeno Station, which I personally did some last minute fights in, though to no avail as the forces of Hak Islam failed. Still, I love the cross-brand synergy, that's very, very cool. The new models are, as you'd expect, absolutely amazing. Take a look at the old two, De Lamy with Panzerfausts, and here's the new one. I love that she's got a new shotgun model, and they've also given her an upgraded and much more attractive Panzerfaust that folds up. The Hoplite, or Hoplite, um, depending on if you use English or Greek, looks amazing! Now, I will say, I was afraid it was going to be a little bit short, but honestly, it's fine. He's crouching down. I, I don't want every single model to be gigantic and breaking the silhouette standards. This is a cool model and a cool sculpt, so yeah, he's a little short, whatever. The Therakites, or Therakitai plural, are also amazing! The shields look great, and it makes me wish I'd done a better job with my old one here. I love how they don't have chain rifles anymore, and so they have pulsars. I love that light rocket launcher. Ah, oh, they're just really cool. I love how it folds up, too. It gives it a much more sleek and miniaturized look than, say, like, uh, I don't know, other companies you'll sometimes see a million pieces of gear on there. I don't like that quite as much. The terrain, I put some together already. It's nice, it's better than I expected. I've only got those old terrain packs that are made of like cardstock, and this is much nicer. This is my first time with a thick cardboard. I like that you've got different sizes, so different sized models can hide behind some stuff, but not everything. It's very good terrain. I would like to get more. I have not had the chance to build every single model, 
but I've inspected them and I'm quite satisfied with all of the miniatures. For Hockey's Lom, you get three day Lommy. One of them has a light shotgun of unknown model and a folded up Panzerfaust. This does seem to be an updated version of the older Shaitan tubes you can see here. The Panzerfaust is the Iskari A.S. Khazal, a Khazal being a poem dealing with loss and romantic love. De Lami are hardy peoples from Hakislam, often from the regions surrounding Hakislamite bases who volunteer for dangerous duties. I don't know the model name of the light shotgun she has, but I also assume it's made from Askari. Askari is a Persian word meaning soldier or army, and Askari AS is the state weapons manufacturer for Hakislam. The Barid and De Lami here both have the very popular Askari AS Sayad. Sayad essentially means hunter, fisher, or shooter a basic weapon for a basic purpose. The Sayad is very popular with paramilitary groups as well as state soldiers. It's not quite as accurate as the combi rifles and it's less comfortable to use, lacking the AI assisted recoil compensation of Synetics branded weapons. But it does have the all important shotgun, which is integrated into all Sayad rifles. Sayad shotguns have two modes. The first is a blast mode, which sprays a cloud of lethal flechettes in an indiscriminate cone. The second is hit mode, which concentrates them into a singular, solid slug for increased accuracy and stopping power. The Boktar has a Red Fury of unknown make, which was until recently a proprietary Yujingyu weapon. However, like many Hakislamite troops, she carries a Tuban pistol, which means snake. Boktar are an all-women's regiment that have experienced a heightened state of death thanks to a cocktail of drugs and exotic rituals. As a result, they are quite fearless. I kind of don't love the Hockey Slam Red Fury, mostly because it looks kind of overcomplicated to hold, but that's just me. I do like the big drum magazine. The Hassassin Not Here has a submachine gun. Despite how popular the Hockey Slamite SMG is, I can't find a name for it. For anyone who's a speaker of Middle Eastern or Southwest Asian languages, give me your suggestion for what we should call it. The Lasik uses the Anagaric Viral Sniper Rifle. The Engarek is a poisonous viper native to Turkey. Basically never play Hockey Slam without the Lasik Viral Sniper, because I just adore the model so much. I broke mine years ago and had to use some 3D printed bits, but I still love the pose and poise so much that I can't stay away. Lasik are trained to learn everything about their targets before they execute them, meaning they can spend days or even weeks learning their routine and their style before pulling the trigger. They might say a prayer in your name, but they will still shoot you. If they have their Anagaric, they're going to do some serious damage if they hit. The rifle even has a gigantic 32 round magazine, in case the first 31 shots miss. A quick break to talk more about the terrain. And I love the aesthetic too! They are all reversible, although not all of them actually are interesting. Some of the stuff is just like O12 on one side, and oh boy, we've got Another O12 looking thing, a Darpan Zeno station. So the, there's not as much versatility as I'd like. Still, it's nice and the terrain is high quality, so I can't be too mad. I like that you've got some fun in-universe previews. Check out the miner from Mines Corp. Uh, she's going to appear in Tag Raid, like that a lot. Take a look at the Bashir Velocity thing. Uh, Bashir Velocity has been mentioned many times. I'm sure that eventually we'll get a Kickstarter for a Rem Racer game. Mm, I'll probably get it, uh, but anyway, it's cool to see that sort of in-fiction consistency. The token set is good. I'm not sure what else to say. It's like every other token set they put out. I've always liked when they do this. I, I like when other companies make the um, teardrop templates two into one. That way I could just chuck this first one like a corn husk and use the second larger one because it's got the bigger and larger templates in there. Very nice. All the tokens are of reasonable quality. I'm not sure what you want me to say. They are good tokens. Uh, you probably have more if you've already bought the game. Ooh, there's Dark, that's fun. And I've already put some together and it was pretty easy and I bet that the rest of it will go together pretty easy as well. Now, if we take a look at the other terrain, it's nothing special, like I said. I do like that you've got the contaminated area and roadblock icons. Let's take a look at the Aleph models. This Therocates and the Thyrios have the Lancetta SMG, which is Italian for needle. The company that makes gear for O12 and LF is pretty inconsistent. Sometimes it's IPF or IPM, sometimes it's IPFS, sometimes it's IPS. Sometimes it stands for Italeri de Precisione, which I think is gibberish, but references the miniature model company Italeri. Sometimes it's Industria de Precisione or Precision Industry. All I know is that the company makes expensive, top quality weapons 
used by O12, Aleph, and various mercenaries with deep pocketbooks. This Therocates also has a rocket launcher, which I don't think is named, but looks to be a substantially updated version from the prior O12 and Aleph model. Therocatai, that being the plural of Therocates, all used to have submachine guns, chain rifles, and sometimes nanopulsers. This really annoyed me because it seemed weird to have two large and heavy weapons and never sculpt them on the models. Some of them would also have 360 visors and combi rifles, it was just never very consistent. The ones with the combi used the IPM Dardo, or Dart, with a relatively small 48 round magazine. Now, they all have submachine guns and pulsars, with the pulsar just being an extra large nanopulsar which can be very easily hidden away or placed inside their main weapons, very cool. The resculpted Agema I don't love, nor do I hate. His pose I like quite a bit, his jacket looks fashionable. He is the gigantic IPFS Vera, which I think means turn, no idea. Interestingly, all Aleph units use the PD-8 Detour, a pistol made by franco germanique armaments on Earth. Although they're based in Pano territory, this is the preferred manufacturer for the Nomad military. The new Ekdromos is awesome. Ekdromoi didn't always have such good profiles. In fact, both of the old 2nd edition profiles are now only good as proxies, as they lost the HMG in 3rd edition and the combi now with 4th edition. This Ekdromos is one of many heavy looking hackers, although he's technically not that heavy a trooper. He is, however, awesome. I cannot wait to get this guy onto the table and into close combat. Lastly, the Hoplite looks awesome. I built this guy right away because he just calls to me. The Hoplite armor was originally developed for Achilles, and in fact, Achilles V2 used to be called Hoplite armor, but they changed it to avoid any possible confusion. He wields the IPM Furore heavy machine gun. This pose makes me think of the Omega unit, which is not a bad thing. I love the Omega unit. Alright, so I love the components within. There's no question that I recommend the starter box. The question is, to whom do I recommend Operation Blackwind? Well, if you're interested in Steel Phalanx, this is an instant recommend. You probably have some Therocates lying around from an old box, but these sculpts are 10 years newer. 10 years ago, War Machine was releasing its first Colossals, X-Wing got its first starter box, and Warhammer was engaging in some dark vengeance. It's been a long time in the myopic world of tabletop wargaming, and if you play Steel Phalanx, you deserve these updated models. Also, if you're completely new and want to play Steel Phalanx, this really does just replace the old box. For example, in the old Stealing Phalanx box, you'll just never really use the Myrmidon Hacker, except as an extra Myrmidon. And the Therocates no longer have chain rifles. They're all fine for proxies, I guess, but nowhere near as detailed or interesting as the new ones. The Ekdromos has also been totally reworked in N4, and this is a fantastic hacker sculpt. The Thyrios and Hoplite are totally new, and also only in this box. In short, if you like Steel Phalanx, I think you should pick it up. As for the Hassassins, I'm a tiny bit less certain. This is the only way to get the gorgeous Nadir sculpt, but you can get the Deilami elsewhere. Most Hockey Slam players will throw a Deilami or two with a Panzerfaust in with every list, and you already got one with the old N3 Hassassin starter box. The Lassik is always a gorgeous model, and I love the new one slightly more than the old. The Buktar model is of limited value, to me at least. It's somewhat expensive and pretty easy to proxy another model for. The Barret is pretty good, but again, you can probably substitute the old Barret. Or, if you want, you can just proxy in an old model like the Ghulam Hacker. If nothing else, I guess it's nice to have two. If you are a new player getting into Hak Islam, these are an instant recommend. Don't bother seeking out the old N3 box first, just start with this one. It comes with terrain and tokens and toys, it gets you to the table just that much faster. Just know that it's not a must buy for all Hak Islam players. While Vanilla Aleph can benefit from pretty much every unit in this box, Vanilla Hak Islam might not find quite as much use from all of them. If you own a small collection of Hak Islam but you're on the fence, I'd say split it with a friend. Keep the Hak Islam half. The Deilami also make excellent Ghulam proxies, and if you don't have models like the Barid and want the beautifully sculpted Nadir, then it's a big recommend. This information comes from many sources, and it wouldn't have been possible without the generous review copy of Blackwind. Nor would it be something I even try to tackle without patrons giving me support. I'd really like it if you could give this video a like and a comment if you found this cross-media depiction of Blackwind as interesting as I. The planet Concilium Prima is special. It is the political capital of the human sphere. 
It is the headquarters of the Organization of Twelve Bureaus. It is the core of Aleph. Concilium's O-12's reward to be reaped from decades of cooperation and terraforming. Much of the planet is now dotted with human settlement. The exception is the region of Chula, for the region is highly volcanic and almost entirely unpopulated. Chula means burner in the Urdu language of South Asia. It is an unsubtle name for a region with tremendous geological volatility. Numerous volcanoes spout ash and dust across the continent. The Jowland tectonic plate in the south is being slowly subducted by the Mentor plate to the north. North of the El Gabal Mountains is Loki's land. Here lie the Laufi and Fabauti fault lines. It is a blasted land, too dangerous and too expensive for permanent habitation. To the south is Dergama, named for the demonic form from Indian divinity. Dergama was marked for second wave colonization, as its thick jungle required far more infrastructure to be built in order to house O12's growing national population. Work abruptly stopped when the workers began to die. Plants within Shula frequently produce microspores that are harmless in small quantities, but accumulate in thick fogs beneath the tree canopies. A strong windstorm can bring them down, spelling death for anyone not wearing expensive protective gear. Yu Jingyu scientists did design solutions to the microspores, but Hakislamite master gardeners were afraid of further upsetting the valuable balance of the region's ecosystem. A few years later, Bureau Noir suggested that Durgama's climate could be a blessing in disguise. Deep within the jungles of Chula, top secret research station bloomed like weeds among the toxic forests. These include the Al Futna Labs, the Gekidan Research Park, and Darpan Zeno Station. DARPAN, the Sanskrit word for mirror, is a joint initiative by O12 and the DARPAN Corporation, a Pan-Oceanian company. Its portfolio includes food and genetic research, and it is unique in that its most valuable work is carried out under the patronage and supervision of Aleph. Of course, DARPAN is more than it seems. DARPAN is controlled by Shell Company after Shell Company, and behind this mirror maze lies the Magna Obra Corporation. Magna Obra is the most ruthless corporation in the human sphere. Their domains are marketing, technology, and social engineering. Its popularity gives it the money to fund elite mercenaries like the Drews or Kaplans. What is your desire? Well, Magna Obra can get you what you want, as long as you help them get what they want first. According to the Assassins, Magna Obra's most fearsome tool is the terrorist group known only as Equinox. Their stated goal is to speed up social change through radical science and technology. In some ways, a laudable goal, but everyone knows that former social engineers have left Magna Obra to assist the forces of Equinox. No matter what their stated goals, their methods are always brutal, and their actions always seem to benefit Magna Obra. Equinox is one of the Hassassian Order's oldest enemies, responsible for the Order's near total destruction during a violent phantom conflict decades past. Wherever Magna Obra goes, Equinox conveniently seems to follow. Darpan Zeno Station is therefore a worst case scenario for the human sphere. To understand why, we have to take a step back and turn our attention towards Aleph. Aspects are beings that are spun off from Aleph, raised in accelerated virtual worlds and given an artificial body known as a Lost or Life Host. The process of psychogenesis is not an easy one. Aspects need to be close to LF in outlook and goals, but not identical. There's no need for a totally emotionless robot after all. You want a being that is capable of a little chaos, able to act in ways that LF would not. One such aspect, named Laodiki, had a reputation for more than a little chaos. She was one of the first female aspects created for the Assault subsection, also known as Steel Phalanx. Laodiki possessed an exceptional beauty, a natural charisma, and a razor mind befitting her original namesake, a princess of mythical Troy, taken captive but set free by the victorious Greeks. She was a bit unusual, with the exaggerated personality of an ancient heroine. Laodice was thus deployed to Paradiso during the Second Offensive to help blunt the offense, to help blunt the advance of the combined army. She was deployed in a joint venture between the Special Situation Section and the Shock Army of Acontecimento. This was known as Operation Massive Filter, taking place somewhere in Combined Army territory. On this operation, I have no further details for you. All the information on it is classified, but I can tell you that there were no known survivors and no recovered cubes. Civilians, the Stikos of the Steel Phalanx, the platoon of Shock Army regulars, all gone. 
The only thing we have are rumors, and the rumors state that Laodice was at the center of the maelstrom. There are other rumors, though. Intelligence gathered by Hakizlam suggests that Equinox was involved, that they inserted themselves in whatever Laodice was testing, that they corrupted whatever was supposed to happen, and intended to reap the technological rewards that came from Operation Massive Filter, and, in doing so, cause the deaths of everyone involved. Further, we know that this took place on the exact same day that a pan-oceanian bioweapons program was terminated. That program was designed to create a bioweapon that could cripple Morats, and only Morats, leaving humans untouched. Why it was cancelled is unknown, but there are more than a few who think that it was related to the massive failure of Massive Filter. Laodiki took the brunt of the blame for the operation. Her aspect was to be reconstructed. Essentially, she was to undergo a second psychogenesis, a complete erasure of her personality traits. This was a recreation of her psyche, so intense that she'd be a different person. When complete, she was given another copy of her custom-grown Lost, and sent back into the field as an Iatromantis. An Iatromantis is an ancient Greek medicine man, a physician, a shaman, all of them at once. In the Assault subsection, they are the brightest and most unusual minds, specifically assigned to find weaknesses in the enemies of Aleph and to exploit those flaws. After her reboot and resurrection, Laodice continued to be involved with controversial projects. Much like Fusilier Angus, wherever she went, chaos followed. The first such mission was Operation Lush Valley, and it was carried out in the same region as Operation Massive Filter. This mission went slightly better than the first, in that there was one single survivor, Laodice herself. That's right, once again, all witnesses were killed and their cubes unrecovered. On her return, her old and reckless personality was back. She was nicknamed Pandora after all of the chaos she created. It was a fitting name, and she soon embraced it. Though some question does remain. Who was Pandora? She seemed to have all the personality traits of the original Iodiki, the one who disappeared during Operation Massive Filter. There are two possibilities. The first is that somehow, Laodiki was not killed during Operation Massive Filter. She instead hid out in the jungles and ruins of Paradiso, biding her time and awaiting rescue. When Operation Lush Valley met a similarly disastrous fate, Laodiki eliminated her second self, or simply replaced the corpse with none the wiser. The second possibility is that, despite a complete personality rewrite, despite a nearly total deletion of her personality, something within Laodiki survived. There was some bit of code or something more in her shoot that persisted when all else had gone. Both possibilities seem unlikely, but I personally lean towards the second one. If it was the first, I think that the discrepancies in the Losts might be more notable. But then again, Pandora has clearly proven to be resourceful, eccentric, and if nothing else, persistent. She has failed twice, and doesn't seem to be slowing down with her research. This is especially concerning once you understand the Darpan Corporation. The station operates Xeno Farms and Biospheres, primarily researching novel ways to grow food. Their specific portfolio is Xeno Agriculture, using captured and purchased samples of Toha and combined army flora. They are working to adapt Xenobiological crops to human consumption and vice versa. This requires captive Morats and volunteer Toha. Darpan frequently brags of the coming breakthroughs in the realm of practical colonization and terraforming, all thanks to alien foods. However, there's more to it than meets the eye. All of these Xeno crops require careful analysis of Morat and Toha genetic structure. The foods are tailor-made for them, after all. If you can make a crop that's tailor-made to be nutritious for a specific species, you can also make one that's poisonous. If you have enough data and contacts, you could even make one that's poisonous to just one person, or an entire demographic group. Maybe just the settlers in US Ariadna, or maybe you just need to do some testing across a huge and diverse population. Luckily, you are in Shula, and Dergama specifically. When the winds blow, they scatter those microspores far and wide, and Shula's volcanic activity can scatter them across the entire planet. You may have already put this together. Darpan's project, Pandora's interests, Magna Obra and Equinox. You can see why there's some concern over Darpan Station. You can see why, when the combined army assaulted it during the Dergama Crisis, there was a rapid and brutal response. Although initially overrun by the combined army, the Special Situation Section dispatched troops from Helheim and retook Darpan at great cost. Unfortunately, this only secured it from the aliens, not from fellow humans. Supposedly, the Operation Subsection had performed counterintelligence and had eliminated the Equinox sleepers on site. The Assassins are not so sure. 
Intel ops have strong evidence that Equinox have a backdoor that Aleph cannot see, chooses not to see, or does not recognize as a threat. Equinox penetrated Darpan once. They can do it again. Hussam operatives have evidence that this course of research is not just dangerous, but within the grasp of the Hassassin's oldest enemy. Also of import is that this research is being performed far from the public eye, hidden away where adequate countermeasures cannot be created. Conversely, Aleph feels that this is lawful and private research that the practical gains from xenofarming are worth the risks, that the situation is contained, and that the facility is well guarded under the watchful eye of the Steel Phalanx. There is also the possibility that this is all part of a long plan to draw out Equinox. Consider the role of Pandora. Caught between both sides of the conversation, but willing to do whatever it takes to defend the human sphere. Aware of the threat from Equinox, Pandora leaked classified information to the Hassassin Bahram, that being the intelligence wing of the Hakislamite military. She shares maps, access points, targets of interests, everything they need for a surgical strike. And in the chaos of the Durgama crisis, what better time is there than now? Picture yourself as Yara Haddad. You stand within the Hajira, the chamber. Before you is a hologram. You discuss all of this with the old man of the mountain, the leader of the Hassassins. You don't know who the old man actually is, for they always take on an androgynous form and speak with a soft, subdued voice. You have slowly become among the most trusted interlocutors with the old man, and you propose a five-part plan. The steps are Breeze, Zephyr, Gale, Typhoon, and Cyclone, all after the name of the proposed operation, Blackwind, for it must be stealthing and cunning. This operation's goal is to drive out the last of the Equinox agents, eliminate the most hazardous genetic research, and exfiltrate, possibly with Pandora in tow. All of this you propose to the old man who gives you a knowing nod. You are free to execute this mission or abort it as you see fit. What would you do? Is there an alternative path other than violence? Presented with all this data and all these tools, is there a better way to guard the human sphere? There are few allies available. Pan Oceani will not consent to attacking one of its own corporations. Yu Jing will see this as an opportunity for corporate espionage. The Nomads will only use it as a propaganda coup against Aleph. Ariadna, the Japanese, and friendly aliens are all too far and cannot assist on such short notice. But is there another solution to this Gordian knot? Or, as much as you regret it, are you forced to engage? Must you give the order to do combat with your sometime allies in Aleph? Pandora has told you that they will shoot to kill, that they will defend the station to the very last shouting Greek. There you sit in the Hajira, the flickering glow of the old man waiting before you. The soldiers of the Hassassians are prepared to learn the fate of Operation Blackwind. This is the end of the video. Obviously, I'd like to thank Corvus Belly for their lovely review copy. I'm throwing a punch of my top patrons on screen as well, because without them, this actually wouldn't be possible. I mean, getting a box is great, but without them, I wouldn't have gotten it, and I wouldn't be staying up late to write the script. I certainly wouldn't be cross-referencing a half dozen PDFs and books to try to get my story straight. Next time is another fan request, Hockey's Lob. Thanks, stay safe, be well, goodbye.